Good morning and welcome to Peakland United Methodist Church in Lynchburg, Virginia. My name is John Vest. I'm one of the ministers here at the church and this is our Sunday worship for Sunday, June 6, 2021. I'll be today's preacher and we're starting, depending on how you look at it, a two or three part sermon series. Under the banner, We Are Conquerors, today's sermon will be about what needs to be conquered and the next one will be about how do we conquer. And in between, uh, you're going to hear a special letter next Sunday uh, that I'm going to write to a child who is being baptized. Let us begin with our call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord with your whole heart. On the day I called, God answered me. God's steadfast love endures forever. Thanks be to God. Credo statements have a way of reminding us what we believe is true. And today's affirmation of faith comes directly from Scripture, from the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. Would you join with me? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all things, we are more than conquerors to the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Every week we like to share one of the ways that we've been in ministry. This week, as I am sitting here talking to you, Linwood is actually teaching a member of our congregation about production so that he can help us on the behind the scenes work on putting together things like these virtual worship services. Our homebound member this week is Tom White. I hope you will join me in lifting him up in prayer throughout the week. Will you join me in prayer, please? Merciful God, we try to hide from your presence, knowing that we have traded your abundant life for a wasteland of sin. We have not followed your will, but instead heed other voices and pursue our own desires at the expense of others. We are so misguided that we cannot discern good from evil, making the wrong choice, choosing the wrong side. We ask for the courage to tell you truthfully what we have done. We pray for forgiveness so that we can live with ourselves, with others, and with you. 
you alone can restore us. In steadfast love, look upon us and reclothe us in your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. for the morning comes from the epistles of John, not the gospel, from 1 John uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Let us hear these words. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is a child of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join with me in prayer? Holy and loving God, out of all the words that are being spoken and heard this day, may it be your living word that remains. And by your grace, help us to let all those other words, the words that are in the way, to slip away. Amen. Depending on how you want to look at it, today's sermon is either a twofer or a threefer. It's a two-part sermon or a three-part sermon. Under the banner, We Are Conquerors, I divided a rather long sermon into two parts. What needs to be conquered, which is today, and how do we conquer, which will be the next part. However, we're going to celebrate the sacrament of baptism next Sunday. So between the two-part sermon, as part of worship next Sunday, I'm going to share with you the letter I've written to Emory Johnson on the occasion of her baptism. Taking our baptism seriously, really is at the core of faith. And I think a baptismal celebration fits in quite nicely with the sermon theme. Have you ever considered what distinguishes the church from the rest of the world? The clearest statement I've heard was spoken long ago by Doug Newman, a friend who was district superintendent of the former Norfolk district when I served Colonial Avenue Church in the 1980s. The church, he said, calls people to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's our message. That's our goal. That's our purpose. If we aren't doing that, there is no group outside of the Christian church that's going to take up the slack. But the church is more than a clear purpose statement. It's more than a motto on a masthead. It's more than the verifiable objective in the cognitive domain if you're an educator. Since a church is called to be in the world, but not of the world, 
I think an important question to raise just might be, how? If it is true that only change needs leadership, all the status quo needs is management in order to stay the same, then how is the church supposed to introduce this new saving relationship? How is the church supposed to sustain this new relationship that's supposed to be different from what we've been experiencing? How is the church supposed to do its work? Is there anything so special about being the church that it stirs up the soul of the world? When was the last time you experienced an honest-to-goodness conflict between the church and the world? Not just an issue of scheduling, although I'm going to be suggesting that our schedules say a great deal about what we value and how we prioritize various aspects of our lives, I'm not talking about the decisions we have to make about travel sports and Sunday worship or whether you're going to come to church this Sunday or watch online. I'm talking about a choice, an intentional decision to engage in one way instead of another way, to accept the assumptions and aspirations of one community that will cause you to deny the assumptions and aspirations of another community. The ministry of the church is not set aside for those who bear the title minister. By virtue of our baptism, all believers in Jesus Christ are called and equipped for ministry. Some bear the title, others don't. But all believers carry the same responsibility to live into and, and call others to this saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Such a life gets you caught up in the lives of other people, and often ministry takes place at either the highest or the lowest experiences of living. In one visit, sitting in the living room, you can experience the joy of a spouse who's holding on to a marriage out of deep love and commitment, and for better or worse, is dealing with the stress that mental illness or addiction have brought to that marriage. In one visit, you can cry tears of frustration with a family that struggles to sustain a pregnancy and tears of joy when the pregnancy goes full term and the child you are allowed to hold for a few minutes is declared one of God's miracles. Some people say they never have such experiences. They, they never experience life at either its deepest or its highest, never at its most vulnerable or fragile. No mountaintop, no redemption. Sometimes, sometimes we just don't see it. What's working for us is working. The way we put our lives together, it avoids conflict. That's a good thing. Our priorities and purposes, our routines and expectations, they're serving us well. And although the language may change, the ways of the world being in conflict with the ways of God really is a common theme across the worshiping community. But suppose you don't sense it, you don't feel it, you just don't see it. The idea that you're called to ministry, called to take a stand for something different and point the way to God can be a foreign concept, especially when our lives are working pretty good for us. Why rock that boat? Well, I want to suggest to you, the boat needs rocking when God becomes a mere passenger with us and not captain of the ship. Isn't there more to hope than what the world can offer us? More than the way the world says things ought to be? Suppose the only reality that holds sway in your life really is what the world has determined to find success, defines goodness, what the world determines is acceptable or even possible. Is it possible to become such a citizen of this world that the kingdom of God exists merely as some, some celestial neighbor, the edge of the Star Trek universe? We're not even real, the kingdom of God, merely as a kingdom of conscience. I would suggest that your presence either here on Sunday morning or, or your interest in our online worship, those things indicate 
that God really is present to you in some way. It can be hard to, to turn out the various voices of the world that call to us, but somehow, at some time, and in some manner, I think the voice of God, the voice of love, has come through to you. You are here. And here's the thought. Have we made peace with heaven and earth in such a way that we no longer see much of a conflict between the two? Have we made a peaceful place in our hearts where heaven and earth sit together calmly while the storm clouds of conflict swirl around us? Speaking of himself, Jesus did say, I come not to bring peace, but a sword. That's in Matthew. The biggest problem the corporate church may face, perhaps the biggest problem we individual Christians face, it's not a problem of conflict. It might be a problem of peace. There is simply no longer a felt conflict within us about our worldly ways and our kingdom ways. Is it possible we have made peace with the devil? I read an account a while back of a man whose business was not going well. Heavily dependent on a particular industry, there was a downturn in that industry due to the pandemic, and that downturn trickled down to his shop. He developed a dark cynicism. Life took a turn. He sat in his rather large office. The, the city skyline stretched uh, beyond the big window, and he was tired feeling much older than his 50 years. His marriage was in trouble. His children alienated. Even his physical health was in jeopardy. But he held on to the church, becoming aware of the darkness that was, that was pressing over him. The church's pastor visited, and while admitting it wasn't a certified clinical pastoral education approved technique to offer comfort, the pastor tried to point out all the things the man had achieved in the world of business. The employees who fed their families because of him. The fact that he, he'd never been sued. That's a good thing. And the businessman agreed with an important caveat. That may be true, he told his spiritual advisor. But even if you win the rat race, what good is it if you're still a rat? What good indeed. Was the life of Jesus Christ about holding himself accountable to the expectations of those around him? Or was it about holding those around him accountable to the one greater than us all? And the church, the body of Christ in the world, has the church become merely another institution for doing good in that world? I mean, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the disenfranchised? Or do we believe that there exists a basic and primal conflict between the way of the world and the way of God? And is that a conflict we are marshalling ourselves against? I think that's an important question to ask, and we ought to periodically check in with the way we are answering it. Son, I want you to go to college, but do you want to go to college? What's going to be your path in the world? Daughter, starting your own business, that's commendable. Is this the difference you plan to make in the world? Is it going to be better because of your business? Church, finding a need and filling it in the name of Jesus Christ may be the very definition of ministry. But as we feed the hunger, as we host those blood drives, as we open the free clinics, are we holding the institutions who hoard food responsible, who hoard medicine, who limit health care, or any of the other basic human needs, are we holding them accountable for the sins of estrangement from God and neighbor? In every case, son, daughter, church, the question is deeply theological for it asks about us and God and our neighbor and how it all fits together. 
So this is what I would ask that we think about between now and when we come back together in a couple of weeks. We're going to move from the idea of what needs to be conquered in this world to how we as a Christian church ought to be conquering. So may I ask you to think about this. Filaret of Moscow, a saint of the Russian Orthodox Church once said, a fish is alive because it swims against the flow of water. One that is dead floats down with the water. A true Christian goes against the current of the age. I would add that as we know how a fish breathes, how gills work, a fish must flow against the current in order to stay alive. Without that tension, it cannot breathe. Without that tension, it cannot live. Without that tension, it will die. So what current are you swimming against? Congressman John Lewis spoke of getting into good trouble. What good tension is calling you to Christian service? Beloved of God, it is worth pondering. So let us ponder together. So let it be. Amen. Accept life as a gift, and may you live your life in such a way that everyone about you will know that you are grateful. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, so let it be. Amen. Lord, you said we face trouble, pain, and fear, but you be